Hey everybody, it's John Wecroft here again with another Sunday Q&A. We're up to number 21. So uh, I'm hoping that you're enjoying these and that you're still finding them interesting and hopefully inspiring. Um, I've got some really great questions this week, one of which is about that idea of how we maintain motivation, you know, and how you can use certain inspiration to keep us practicing. So we'll deal with that one in a moment. First off, as I do every week now, uh, as a challenge for myself, I'm going to play a piece for you. And I've chosen this week the jazz standard, All the Things You Are. It's, it's just an evergreen tune. It's such a great tune to play on. There's a lot of chord changes, but they all kind of make sense. It moves through a variety of different keys, but it does so in such a kind of uh, a musically logical way that it's not too tricky to play over. Once you've sort of got your harmonic ducks in a row, as it were. Uh, so that's maybe something I could talk about after I've played the piece. There's definitely something with these tunes about preparation. You need to be prepared in terms of, well, certainly it's helpful for me anyway, to know what's coming up and be thinking about what I'm playing in the moment, but then also anticipating what's about to come up. And that's really one of the skills with playing through chord changes. It's the ability to be doing one thing whilst working on the next thing, or whilst at least sort of preparing yourself for the next thing. I guess a bit like, you know, a great chess player thinks, you know, many shot, uh, many moves ahead, you know, or uh, a great snooker player is not thinking of a shot, or a golfer maybe is perhaps thinking of the second or third shot, not the one that they're, they're actually playing at that moment, because it's almost a given that they're going to achieve, you know, a snooker player is probably going to pot the shot that they're, uh, that they're taking that's not what wins them games it's it's thinking ahead and thinking about where they're going to leave themselves for the next thing and, and it's a bit like that with improvising through chord changes if all you do is think about the change that you're on at any given time then you might find you put yourself in a really difficult position for what's about to happen whereas if you're thinking okay i'm on i'm in this harmony at the moment i'm in you know, I happen to be in A flat major and in a moment it's going to go to C major and I need to think about a way to connect those things together. And then from C major, the C major becomes a C minor, but it's not really, in this case, uh, the one chord in C minor, it's a six chord, you know, in a six, two, five, one. And, and you know, if you think that ahead, then you can think, okay, well, this tune's moving through, you know, maybe four or five different key centers. There's a whole bunch of stuff in A flat. Then there's a little bit of stuff in C major. And then there's a bunch of stuff uh, in E flat, and then it goes to G major, and that's a kind of parallel move. It's the same move transposed. Okay, and then we've got our G major thing. Then we've got a little deceptive cadence in E major. We need to be ready for that. And then we have an end section, which is basically just lots of A flatness, but but with some uh, uh, kind of related harmony, but from within the A flat tonality. We talked about this with Stella by Starlight few months ago perhaps um, where we said it's it's all related to B flat so even the things that are not necessarily in B flat it's the, we can still find a trace of uh, connection there so the last uh, the last section in this tune you know we've got the six two five one thing happening then we've got something that goes four four minor then it feels like a three but really the three is the one and then we have a flat three diminished, but really that's the one diminished. And that's something that we dealt with again a couple of weeks ago, you know, seeing how a diminished chord can actually function as a true diminished as opposed to some kind of passing dominant chord, which is what it is in this particular tune. It's functioning as a true diminished. It's one of those rare instances where you, we get to use the diminished scale from the tone, semitone perspective rather than the half tone whole tones perspective as something you might play over dominant chords but anyway so maybe I've done that already so that's kind of the analysis of all the things you are but but uh, the the, uh, the beauty of these things or at least the challenge of these things is that in practice you you're looking to do this kind of analysis and obviously I've done that you know and I've looked at the detail within those things but when I play I honestly can say that I try not to think about any of that stuff really at all on a conscious level I'm hoping that by practicing these things uh, with a really kind of purposeful intent, that what it does is it plants them somewhere in the subconscious so that when we actually play, I can be thinking about music and thinking about uh, you know, the pacing of, a, of what I'm playing, thinking about uh, the sort of the intensity 
or the uh, the kind of uh, the volume of it like am I overplaying is there too much happening is there not enough happening is there a sense of flow you've got all that to think about so if you're still thinking okay now it's going to D major or whatever or in this instance you know we're in A flat oh it's come here comes C major maybe you've still got a little bit of way to go in terms of uh, thinking about things in a conscious way to plant them in a subconscious way. I mean, I'll still address those things in my mind. I'll still think, okay, here comes the G major section. But it's kind of, you know, I will can find myself when playing through these things completely switching off to that altogether and just allowing the subconscious to kind of sort of, uh, to sort of take control of the, uh, of the steering wheel, shall we say, so that uh, I can look out and keep my eyes on the road because there's more, there's things that you can't really anticipate for or in an improvised situation, there's things that hopefully will come up in a spontaneous way, whereas the core changes are not spontaneous. They're not going to suddenly change at any given point. They're one thing that is a given. So in that scenario, there's no real kind of uh, excuse for me to not be prepared and not know what they are. You know? So again, maybe just one last thing before I'll attempt to play the tune and maybe uh, I'll eat my words in a few minutes once I've actually done that. But um, here's something that I think so this could be kind of thing number one for today is if you can't do this right then you don't know the tune right so if i put the guitar kind of away so i obviously i can't play it right so i'm not even going to look at the fingerboard and think about any of this at all but you should be able to go okay the harmony in this particular piece um like where does it begin you know so it starts on an f minor chord and then it goes to a b flat minor chord then it goes to an e flat seven then it goes to an A flat major seven, then to a D flat major seven, and then it could go D two five one. Some uh, uh, real books or whatever say like G seven C major seven, or it could go D minor seven G seven C major seven, because that's the first kind of section dealt with. Then it goes to C minor, but C minor in this case, it's not like kind of a one chord thing. It's like a six chord thing, and because we're, we're then changing to the uh, uh, to the key of E flat. Yeah, so so that then we got C minor, uh, then we go to two five one F minor B flat seven E flat, A flat major seven, D flat major seven, two five one in G major. So so if can you see what I'm doing here? Is I'm 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 storyboarding the chord progression without having to play it because sometimes what can happen when you play these things on the guitar, you sort of got into a muscle memory thing. Uh, I found one of the best things about the, the upright bass, me, me kind of making a transition to playing that quite a lot, is that uh, I can't really rely upon the same motor skills as I can when I play on guitar, because I can play the changes of all the things you are with third and seven voices, and I'm not even thinking about them anymore, because I've practiced that maybe a few thousand times in my life. Like, so now, I don't even know what... If I'm being honest, as I'm playing that, I don't even know what chords I'm playing. I'm not obviously I do know what they are, but I'm as I'm playing that, I'm not thinking. That's just that's all that is in my mind. It's it's the sounds of those events. I can break it down afterwards and say, okay, it was a you know, this chord going to this chord and so on. But that's rather like talking about uh, telling a joke or something or, or reading a line of poetry and, and identifying where the nouns, the verbs and the adjectives are. Now, of course, we can do that if, if you know, you, we know what a noun is and, you know, you know that you, you can stick the in front of something and it's a noun and, you know, you can stick to in front of something and it's a verb and you can put is in front of something and it's an adjective. Right. <clears throat> but... You may remember that from school, you may not, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, you're using nouns, verbs, adjectives, you're constructing sentences, using quite complex grammatical rules when you speak. But I'll imagine if you're speaking in the first language, you don't think about that at all. But if you suddenly decided you wanted to learn to speak Spanish or something, then you're going to have to deal with nouns, adjectives and verbs, and you'd probably be thinking about it in a conscious way. So that's akin to... If you're, uh, someone brings a brand new tune on you that you've never heard before, or you're, uh, you're maybe trying to get a grip of a completely different style of music that you've not played before, then you're going to have to maybe employ some of those rules, and it's going to feel conscious, and it's maybe even going to feel 
like you're regressing at first because you're going to have to revisit uh, a place or revisit a kind of a process that in your chosen style, the thing that you do when you play, the, you know, the music that you just play without thinking of it, uh, you can do that without thinking. So it feels like in actual fact, you know, it's a step backwards, but it's a necessary step when trying to uh, master a new skill. So, so I'm hoping that that might be some uh, some food for thought. Anyway, if nothing else, as I say, I don't profess to know all the answers to these things. This is just the sort of the product product of practicing this stuff and staying on top of these things for some thirty plus years now. Uh, yeah, maybe a bit more. Um, and also the fact that I'm aware, I know what it feels like as someone who's a rock player to try and dip a toe into the world of jazz because that's what I did you know 25 years ago you know I came at it from Van Halen and you know and whilst I, I mentioned you know Van Halen let's hear it for Eddie you know of course he passed away this week which is a tragedy um, and I still love his playing as much as I did when I was a teenager or what have you but that's that's the music that I came from was Hendrix and Clapton and so on so then when trying to kind of figure out what Pat Metheny's doing it's a culture shock you know it's like a completely different language although there are some similarities again there are parallels there between learning Spanish and learning English you know a lot of the vocabulary we shared and words have the same root with a different end and all that. anyway enough talk so I'm going to play all the things you are uh, I've given myself so this this is something I'm going to talk about maybe a little later as well is the idea of goal setting purposeful practice I've given myself the goal of this is going to happen in three takes that's what I've given myself today pretty busy at the minute lots of stuff going on uh which is great you know it's positive but it means if i give myself an infinite number of takes uh, i could be here all day you know and still not happy with with what i've done because i can always find faults and stuff but uh if you give yourself a deadline and stick to it then it's surprising what the subconscious will bring to the table when you know okay well, you've only got three shots at this so make them good you know whereas if you think okay i've got as many goes at this as I want you kind of like or, you know one is or I am giving myself the excuse to mess up you know uh, whereas you know you, I'm going to give myself three takes at it you know let's we'll see which one it is you know um, and that's it and I'm really going to stick to that you know unless of course something disastrous happens like a break of string or whatever something unavoidable because sometimes again my experience could be uh, that I think that the 15th take is the best one and then I go back and listen to the first one and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it I just thought there was something wrong with it or something that I didn't like when I listened to it the first time so anyway enough talk from me let's hear some music and I'll see you on the other side of all the things you are <laughs> Thank you. 
hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that was take three, by the way, just uh, if you're interested to know. Uh, I really love dipping into the jazz standard repertoire, you know, that core body of tunes that, uh, that get called on gigs, but also just serve as, they serve as a real f like focal point or a focus point in your practicing. There's that many great tunes that all have different harmonic things happening that uh, you should never be at a loss for something to practice if you're playing in this idiom. Uh, and also the great thing about it is it allows you to get together with other musicians and you've got a core repertoire of pieces so that rather than kind of that, uh, that thing that can happen in a jam situation where it's like, well, what do we play? And everyone kind of doesn't really know. Blues in A, you know, and you end up kind of reverting back to you know, some kind of modal one chord vamp that goes on forever. With this, it's like a ready-made topic. It's like, okay, we all, we already know, or we, we hope that players in, in this idiom already know a kind of a shared repertoire of pieces. Uh, so we've got a point from where we can begin. Um, and I often do this as a practice thing, particularly when uh, there's a scenario where I've got no repertoire to learn because for whatever reason I'm playing gigs I've played before and you know I'm already okay with the tunes. And I got this concept from a great friend of mine, an amazing guitar player, you should check him out, uh, called Andy McKenzie. Andy's a, just a winner on so many levels as a player. But the one thing that, that continually impresses me and certainly was one of the, uh, the things that when I was drawn to him when we first met was it was just apparent to me that he just knew so many tunes and really, really knew them. In fact, I saw him play when we, this would be kind of, I think, when we first were introduced to each other, at one of Trevor Owens, Wrexham Guitar, North Wales Guitar Festivals. And uh, Mundell Lowe was playing solo, I think. I think at some point he knew Andy was there in the audience. He said, I want to play a duet. Is Andy McKenzie in the house? You know? And Mundell called some obscure Miles tune of one of those albums, the albums that Miles brought out when he was trying to get off the hook with some uh, recording contract. And he went in and recorded like an album a day, I think, for five days because he owed the record label that many albums. And he had walking with the Miles Davis quintet and just whatever they were, you know. They all had that with the. And he caught one of the tunes off one of those albums, if I remember right. And I vaguely heard it before. And uh, and that's what Mundo wanted to play. And Andy, without missing a beat, was like, what key? You know, like, not like, what key is it in? It was, what key do you want to play it in? It's like, I could, it doesn't make any difference to me what key you call. And I was like, wow. You know, to just have that confidence, just go, call, call anything, like absolutely anything. And just then, uh, as blasé as, as, as you like, you know, oh, yeah. What key do you fancy? Yeah, okay, that okay, great. After four, I was like, okay, how do you do that? You know, I wanted to know how you did that. So when I when I cornered him at, one, at uh, some stage afterwards, um, my question was, you know, how do you get to that level of uh, of, of uh, comfort with the repertoire? And he said, I just pick a tune a week. Was his answer. Uh, um, so this week it might be all the things you are, you know, and and, and he, he frames his practicing around this tune. So like if he's going to work on arpeggios, he's going to work on the arpeggios to this. If he's going to work on scales, he's going to work on which scales fit this tune. If he's going to work on chord melody, he's going to do it to this tune. If he's going to work on 3-4, you see where we get with this. I'm going to work on Latin feels. Okay, we play it with a Latin feel. I'm going to work on double time phrasing. You put it into a musical context. And so that's something that I like to do, particularly when there's no repertoire, you know, when everything's kind of covered and I'll just pick a standard. And it's another one of the reasons why these things are so great for me to do these Sunday Q and A's is, you know, what's the tune for next week? And that'll be something that I come back to from a practice perspective daily, you know, every day I'll play. So for the last week, every day I've played all the things you are, you know, and things like I, I, I put together the backing tracks as well. I don't use stock backing tracks which is another good thing because then it means I need to figure out you know, how to walk the bass through it. You know, I need to mix it and then I'm okay with the comp and it doesn't get in the way because the last thing I'd want to do is produce my own accompaniment that I don't like playing over. You know? <clears throat> so I'd say the first thing here in terms of uh, to answer this question that I got from Dan, uh, thanks, for the, thanks for sending me that email, was to do with uh, maintaining like motivation, focus, particularly in lockdown, you know, when there's no gigs. <laughs> But the first thing is a sense of purpose. So in this instance, one of my sort of sense of purposes for this week 
was all the things you are, mix it and then I'm on top of it. And this week I've played it in different keys, I've played it in different time signatures. Uh, one day I, I played it in three, four, the next day I thought I'd do it in five, four. Uh, I've played it fast, I've played it slow, I've played it any which way, I've done a Django type version of it, you know, like any which way that you might wish to play that piece. I've kind of had a crack at it, you know, I've done it solo, chord melody, I've done it where I don't play any chords and it's just single notes, you know, I played it unaccompanied with just a, um, a click on two and four, but just improvising through the changes with nothing to help me. All of those things, they're preparation to try and leave out kind of post-it notes in your subconscious, you know, so that like at some point, you know, when you sleep or whatever, then, you know, you yield these things. Uh, these suggestions that you're leaving for yourself and then it just comes out in the way you play. Uh, that's something that I, I, uh, I talked with a great length with the amazing percussionist uh, drummer, ridiculous polyrhythmic drummer, Pete Zeldman. He's just out of this world. And he's really big, Pete, on uh, on the power of the subconscious. And, and I've got to say, you know, it, it was it's always illuminating talking to him. He's amazingly erudite and, and super, super bright and just like sees things from... A real perspective of clarity <clears throat> but the problem of course with trying to feed the subconscious is you can't really communicate directly with it so there is that thing of like just leaving suggestions out working on stuff and then sleeping on it and practicing when you're asleep and stuff like that you know uh, if you really want something badly enough you know but that means that you have to be clear in what it is that you want you know because sometimes vague instructions not helpful to go i want to get better well who doesn't you know everybody wants to get better at everything you know but you have to be more selective and think okay well i want to make certain that by this time next week you know i'm completely okay with the core progression to all the things you are you know i want to make certain by this time next week i'm fine with playing it in five four you know so whatever it might be whatever the goal is if you've got a goal to work towards then your practice becomes purposeful so a really great book that you might want to check out that deals with this is uh outliers malcolm gladwell and it talks about the topic it kind of like repopularized this idea of the 10,000 hours to mastery you know like the route from here to Tiger Woods is 10,000 hours you know uh, but unfortunately some people sort of misinterpreted it and thought 10,000 hours of any kind of practice will get you there but it's not necessarily that it's 10,000 hours of purposeful right I'm really critical uh, but in a positive way critical self-analysis re-evaluation pushing yourself into uh, uncomfortable areas, figuring out where the margins are and stuff like that. You know? So I would suggest that, to, in answer to your question, Dan, the first thing is is maybe, and something I've been doing with, I've started teaching back in university, uh, doing some uh, just guitar sessions in, in uni, so there's a, a, a three that I work for. Um, and because it's kind of like the first weeks, it's good to set the stall. So what I've, what I've said to the students, I'll say to you guys as well, uh, that spend you know half an hour or whatever over a coffee trying to figure out what those goals are. What are your goals over the next three months or two months or month or whatever? What is it that you exactly specific, you know, tangible, what actual things do you want to work on and become better at? And then then deal with it on a kind of more immediate level. Okay, how are you gonna uh, like attack that in the next week? So it's one thing saying I want to work on changes and being able to play through chord changes. That's one thing I want to be good at. And then you go, okay, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that by taking three standards and really analyzing them. Great, okay, cool. Right, which ones? You know, and you go, I don't know, autumn leaves, all the things you are, blue bossa, say. Then you go, okay, now what are you going to do today? Okay, well, I'm going to make certain that I've got the, uh, the first eight bars of blue bossa down. Okay, that's a really specific thing, and you can probably do that. Whereas if your goal is, I want to be like Pat Metheny, well, great, you know, good luck with that one. You need to figure out what the you know, thousands of small steps are to, to get you closer to that. You know? and, and one of those things would be knowing the first eight bars of Blue Bossa. Right? But knowing the first bars of Blue Bossa will not make you Pat Metheny, but it's a step in the right direction. And then you go, the next practice session, I'm going to learn the next eight bars. And I'm going to make... Make sure I know all the arpeggios that go with it. Then I'm going to develop some vocabulary that might fit in there. Then maybe you might, you know, we be creative with this stuff because obviously the activities are based around the outcome. So you've got to have what I would consider to be like sort of 
long term goals, you know, and that could be something that could be over a period of months, maybe even years. Then you've got short term, what you might do on a week by week basis. So short term goal for me this week was all the things you are for next you know, for next week's tune, as it were, going back a week. But then immediate goals are, okay, how am I gonna do that? Well, in this session, I'm gonna play it in three, four. And that's a specific thing. And you can get that done in 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Three or four of them a day, we're rocking, you know. And that's what I tend to work on, the principle of three or four a day, three or four different practice sessions. It's actually usually four now, and one of them's on the bass, because I make, wanna mix it, and then I'm playing the bass every day. And that coupled with all the other stuff, things like this and just playing and teaching and obviously usually gigging, rehearsing, they've still got some rehearsal sessions going on the go. Um, that amounts to, over the period of a year, significant amount of practice, you know. So hopefully, you know, it's better to do that purposeful practice um, than, than sort of be clock watching and go, oh, I've been playing for so many hours today and go, yeah, what have you done? What have you achieved in that time? And if what you've achieved is you know, stared at the TV or been looking out the window, then that's great to a certain extent. But you know, maybe if you did half the amount of time but twice the level of kind of concentration, you, you achieve more. And it's still cool. And trust me, I, I still do that watching a movie whilst noodling on the guitar. I do as much of that as well, but I don't really call that practice. That's a different thing. That's just relaxation, I guess. That's like, you know, like almost like habit forming kind of comfort blanket uh, behavior, you know. Whereas practice for me is, you know, sort of turning everything off, you know, social media is off, internet's off unless I need it for the practice. Uh, with an express, explicit uh, like goal in mind and then working on it and at the end then being critical and going, okay, how how well have I achieved that? Am I done or do I need to come back at this and then, then planning when I'm gonna come back at it? So I'm hoping that answers your question and I'm hoping it might um, give you some ideas of your own. Again, you know, as with all of these things, I'm not professing to be uh, the definitive, th this is not the definitive route to how you do this stuff. It's just what works for me. And it's something that I can fit into my life. It's a pretty busy life. Uh, and where I can kind of go to the supermarket or go to the cinema without being thinking, oh, I should be doing more, you know? Because there's also that thing about, like, it's the resting time in between practice where the, maybe arguably where the progress takes place. You know, so you, you practice stuff and you think about it and then you just don't do it and come back to it. And sometimes it's the period in between doing it where, where you actually make the improvements. I'm sure you've experienced that where something's not really working you can't really get, get it to happen at all. And then you just stop it. And then for whatever reason, you don't even think you're thinking about it, but it's going on in the back of your mind. You come back at it the next day and you can just do it better. You know, maybe that's, you know, without wishing to get too sort of deep, that's where dreams come in and daydreaming and all that kind of stuff, you know. But it all starts with having a pretty clear goal as to what it is you're trying to achieve. Because if you don't know what you're aiming for, how do you know when you've done it? You know? And then that's when you can sort of uh, become demotivated because your brain will play all kinds of tricks on you and convince yourself you're getting worse rather than better. So that can be the first thing, first topic for today. So I know it's probably more philosophical than it is sort of physical, but I'm hoping, you know, in my experience, you know, with some of the great teachers I've been fortunate to study with, you know, the likes of Pete Zelvin, you know, he's, he's amazing. You know, it's often... Uh, it's often the philosophical things that have the most impact because they're the universal things, you know. Th so that doesn't matter, I would guess, if you're trying to get, you know, a better golf swing or something like that, you know, um, as opposed to, you know, learning to play paradiddles or whatever or being able to play polyrhythms or being able to alternate pick through the major scale. So it's as much a psychological process as it is anything else. So I'm hoping that uh, that, that might shed some light or, or maybe even just give you some like a different perspective on stuff. So, enough talking and show us some licks. I can hear you shouting at your computers or your smartphones or whatever you've got. So far be it from me to disappoint you. So let's uh, look at some more practical performance orientated examples. And the first of, uh, of which is based on a question from Andy, who's asking about more intervallic ideas, how to incorporate more intervallic ideas in one's playing. So the topic we're going to look at here is sometimes referred to as octave displacement. And it literally means 
taking something and displacing it by an octave. It's, it's a literal kind of uh, application of the expression. So it could be within a chord shape, it could be within a phrase. It's, it's kind of quite useful this and it's multifaceted. So we'll start off with octave displacement within a very, very simple phrase. So our chosen example will be pentatonic in C minor. Maybe get to C seven sharp nine perhaps. Okay, so that phrase is going G, F, E flat, C. Okay, so to demonstrate this, now what we're going to do, we could of course move the whole thing with the whole phrase, which is a form of octave, it's not really a form of octave displacement though, that's more octave transposition, I guess, if you move the whole phrase. To displace, what we do, we take one or more elements and we move them either up or down. So instead of going G, F, E flat, C, we might go G, F, E flat, C. So phrase number one. Variation number two. Okay, same exact, Pitch location just in different octaves, so it changes the shape of the notes. Okay, phrase number three might go. Still the same phrase. G, F, E flat, C. Phrase number four. Now we're in different octaves altogether. It's G, F, E flat, C. Same note, same order. Or I could go. So, so I think that was five, wasn't it? So let me play them one more time. So number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. different ways of saying the same thing. So that's within a simple phrase. Uh, you could also do this within chord voicings. This is sort of how drop two and drop three chord voicings work. So just to demonstrate that, if I take something like uh, C major seven, like so, and drop two voicing works by taking this second from highest note, the G, I'm putting it on the bottom, so you end up with Refingering that to find them on four adjacent strings, drop two voice ends, and then they they can be moved from like the lowest four voice ends through each inversion and they invert really nicely. So the beauty of these things is not firstly that they invert really well, and secondly that they're playable, whereas some of these other inversions are not playable. So this one's okay. Three, five, seven. Not so keen on this though. Seven, uh, root, root three, five. That, you know, we'll try playing with a G on top. It's impossible. It's just not playable, you know, unless you use some kind of extended technique or what have you. Whereas, you know, to, to play these voicings, like where the fifth is on the bass, or the seven is the lowest, or the root is the lowest, or the third is the lowest. They're totally playable, uh, as opposed to a top three voice in, where we take those four notes, and in this case, we take the third and put that in the bass. So instead of it being this, we then get that voice in, or you can play here. And you know, I'm sure you know voices like so. So these are a form of octave displacement, these kind of chord voicings that form the bedrock sort of knowing the guitar, harmonically speaking. You can even expand that to things like there's a major nine, which is essentially just four notes, root, uh, sorry, seven, root, second, third, but not played seven, root, second, third, played like this, you know, seven is here, root, second, third, they're all jumbled up. And of course you can re reorder them, in this case, instead of it being root three, 
seven, nine, I flip these two notes, uh, the roots and the seven around. So that happens. So instead of this, you can have uh, this voice. Or uh, you can invert these things and put them through into the potential inversions. And this kind of thing on the go. So that's really just four cluster notes, but with octave displacement, it doesn't feel like they're a cluster, it feels like they're a distance away. So maybe that could be the second thing. So first one, simple phrase, take a point of that phrase and move it around, okay? Or you take a chord voice in and you take one of the notes in that chord voice in and you put an octave lower, it gives me a new chord voice in and I can go through each of the inversions. Or you take a different note in that chord voice in and you put that in the bass and we have what we call drop three. It's a form of octave displacement. Okay. Now some players do this to create a sort of like crazy intervallic sound, you know, Joe DiOrio and Osnoy and all those kind of guys. Um, Don Mock. So maybe I'll give you three examples of how they might use it. So ours might take the C major scale and display certain notes within. So that was C major. But just in different octaves. So C here, then D, not next to it, an octave higher, and then E down, and F higher, and then G higher, and then A, B. Again, check out Oz Noy. Uh, he's, he's got some educational material that deals with this type of stuff. But you know, Oz is maybe of a similar generation to me, so he's going to be aware of Pat Martino. Uh, he's going to be aware of Don Mock. I'd be pretty sure that he's aware of Don Mock. I'd be aware that he's uh, familiar with Joe DiOrio, and Joe DiOrio would have these kind of phrases, things like that, you know, which is a chromatic scale. Instead of going every third note and fifth note, one, two, three, four, five. It's going down an octave. Okay. Um, and you're gonna send that. And we, we looked at I play a lick based on that in one of my tunes, Avalanche, which was one of the questions uh, from Matt, I think, months ago. You know, what was that? You know, uh, or maybe yeah, I'm not sure who asked the question. But anyway, what was that lick? You know, breaking that breaking that lick down, uh, which was based on octave displacement. So great though they are, and 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 many players have got their own ways of doing these things. Don Mock's way of doing this stuff was to take uh, something in groups of three and displace every third. So instead of going dun, dun, boom, it would be so that would be C major scale. So B C high D E F G uh, A B C, and you can do this kind of thing, tapping or whatever. You know, you can hear players doing versions of this by displacing with tap notes. Um, yeah, Matthias Eklund and Ron Thal are quite keen on those kind of things, but doing it with extended technique. So great as they are, and it's still octave displacement, they tend to sound a bit sort of wacky and bonkers, like, you know, let's do some, like, um, like unusual kind of sound and intervallic idea as a, as a showstopper, really. So you don't really need that many different permutations of this. You just need a few, I guess. But there are ways of doing this in a more, shall we say, conventional way, uh, like rather like this or which they just sound like licks that you know you could hear in your head whereas you know that most of us don't hear the major scale in that way it's a way of disguising something and making something familiar sound unfamiliar so let me show you how you might use octave displacement in a more familiar way right so and this will also deal with two five ones um, and one of the most common connections and voice leading in a 2-5-1. So if I'm in the key of C, I might go D minor, 
to G7, or maybe G7 flat 9, C major, so D minor 7, G7 flat, flat 9, C major 7. And a typical line might be D minor arpeggio, D minor 7 arpeggio, drops down a semitone, G7 flat 9, which is like a diminished arpeggio, to C, like so. doing is we're connecting the 7 of the D minor to the 3 of the G7 and this is kind of typical bebop language and why don't we do this just to make it doubly cool we'll maybe add like a 3 half diminished to make the 1 sound bluesy it makes the C sound like as if it becomes C dominant A7 D minor G7 just for extra fun yeah It feels kind of exercise like, doesn't it? Because everything's sort of going in one direction, then a big jump, and then it all goes in one direction. So, even though that's technically correct, um, it doesn't seem to sound so fluid and connected, which a lot of those lines, if you listen to Parker, his lines sound really, really kind of. Uh, like natural sounding, like they're the lines that you might hear in your head, and I don't know about you, but I don't really hear that that leap. It's moving all in one direction too much, you know. So we can use octave displacement as a means to uh, to stop the line from being so jaggedy. I'm going to move on to something else. We'll come back to that in a second because something's occurred to me that would be a great demonstration for this. Right, if you took Something similar to a famous Jimi Hendrix song. Uh, I better not say the name, or, or it will probably this will get removed from Facebook if I said it. But we all know, even though it's not written by Jimi Hendrix, so there's a clue. Uh, you might recognise this bass line. Uh, the original goes. Okay, so that's moving through five chords, isn't it? C, G, D. A, E, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five chords, right? But it's only really moving a major third away. Like, down, 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 and that's where it ends, right? Whereas if I play this without it leaping an octave, it's gonna do this. That's how much range it's gonna take. To really make that happen, it's gonna go from here. It's two octaves and a third. What keeps it within a, sh in a confined musical range is the fact that we, instead of going up to a note, we might, when we choose, go down to a note. So when we go C, bass lines use octave displacements all the time. Uh, walking bass lines and funk bass lines and riffs like so. So this is basically a C major triad with chromaticism connecting to the note of G, which becomes the root of the next triad. But what happens, so it doesn't just keep going up, now G, now D, and now A, and then um, eventually E on the end, so C, G, D, A, and then we end on, like on, on the E there, right, it's, it jumps down to the note, so instead of going C, E, as you'd expect, it goes C, E, lower, now it goes up, then it goes down, there's the octave displacement there. That's a classic example of octave displacement in action. Okay. It looks like the Hendrix estate infiltrated my computer and corrupted that recording. So let's take it again from this point. Uh, right, so octave displacement. So in this famous riff from a song recorded by many, but in one instance by Jimi Hendrix, which shall remain nameless, uh, we displace in octaves to keep the lick within a limited range instead of it being like so. Okay, now we can do the same thing with our jazz phrase, our phrase of. So what we're going to do here is just maybe take the first note. So the notes are D, F, A, C. 
So now I'm going to go D, F, A, C. contained and gives us a variation. Three, four, one. Kind of jumping around within the arpeggio. Okay, so if we can do it with the first part, I can also do it with this part. So instead of going B, D, F, A flat, I can go B, D, F, A flat. So this now gives me, if I use the initial first idea, Contained. So it doesn't have to happen on, on all of them, like on our Hendrix riff, it doesn't, like that's not octave displaced, that is, and that isn't. So you could go normal, octave displaced, if you wished. Or you could, of course, could do both of them, you know, which now gives us... And you will have heard lots of that in... Are. I use that all the time, I don't even think about it. So that would be D minor, G7, and you could do it with different phrases as well. Say our phrase was. Oh no. Or. So it's exactly the same phrase. Yeah. come from you. Yeah. So that would be A flat G, flat G F E major E major third sorry forgive me. It's the major third or E is the major third. If it were minor you'd probably choose an E flat there. Uh, and that could again used to doing this kind of thing and it gives you lots of different variations so let me give you this to end with this particular section so here's a kind of a, a long phrase that goes between a G an E7 an A7 flat 9 and a D7 flat 9 so G E7 flat 9 A7 flat 9 D7 flat 9 that's completely descending So I can displace little bits of this. Now, same phrase. Move up. Keep going down. Up. Up. Or we'll start low. Up. 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 It's exactly the same notes. G. E7 flat 9. A7 flat 9, D7 flat 9. So slowly I'll give you four four different ways to play that. Number one. some introduction to octave displacement. Of course, like many of these things, you can take it further. We can apply it in different ways, but I'm hoping that gives you some ideas. If you're interested in this and you'd like to see a bit more, or you'd like me to take any aspect of it in a different direction, just drop me a line and uh, keep me posted with the kind of things that, uh, that you find interesting and useful, and then I can use that to shape further sessions. But uh, for now, there you go, octave displacement. Let's end with a collection of Django Reinhardt phrases to go with the three we looked at last time. Just by way of recap, here's the first three. I'll just play them uh, really slowly. Play them maybe one time each. So, lick number one was. The 
to a 2 5 1 or a 5 1 in C. Lick 2 was a 2 5 1, but with the 2 chord as a dominant chord. In the key of D. Second idea, and the third idea that we played, if I can remember, what was it? Oh, I remember what it was now. It was a two five one in the key of A. That went. So it's a B minor sixth arpeggio with a bit of chromaticism. So the rhythm is boom. So, in uh, preparation for the next three, you might want to go back and review those. You'll find them on YouTube from last week, number 20. That's Django Licks 1, 2, 3. So we'll continue now with Licks 4, 5, and 6. 4 is the ultimate two-finger lick. So let me play this for you slowly. Um, yeah, it's just using the index and middle fingers, which of course for Django were the only fingers they had that function perfectly. The other two were retracted back into the hand like so. So I'll play this slowly. <laughs> with diminished now Django would do this with the fingers one and two we're not restricted to using fingers one and two so we could maybe use the third finger or even the fourth first time Django plays this plays that line but it's our bridge version or and the chords that are going on now so really simple super simple but super effective yeah really cool that's lick number four bit of sweet picking for lick number five Okay, so here we have a G major arpeggio decorated, I'm just going to, so you can see the pick, then descent, okay, so and that's plausible with two fingers. It's all playable with two fingers, so down, down, up, down, down, or down, 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 down. Probably that I would think with Django. Down, down, and back, and then down, 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 up. So it's a G major arpeggio. So that's sweep. So, you know, if you think uh, sweep picking was invented by Frank Gambali in the 90s or Ingve Malmsteen, uh, you know, the evidence is. Uh, to the country, <laughs> yeah. So I'm not suggesting that Django invented sweep picking, but it was certainly prevalent in his playing. So slowly again. Et voila. So that's uh, lick number, what's that, number five, okay. So we'll go on to lick number six as well, because that contains also a downward sweep. And this is about as simple as you can get. open strings and that idea of going across and coming back one is something to jangle and come sort of looping around the parabolic figure of eight motion looping around and coming back is something that he used a lot and he finished that with B flat augmented or B flat it's actually raised four, not a raised five. It doesn't have a five. And he suggested it's augmented because he follows that with whole tone scale. Now Django's whole tone scale fingerings 
could either go into one of two directions if you play from B flat, say. If you play three notes per string, of course, I'm not playing them the way Django would. He would probably go like this. Like he does in uh, improvisation number two. That's two notes on a slide or a reposition of some kind. If you play them two notes per string, however, they move diagonally across the guitar neck, except for this string. So we heard that in uh, this one. That's that two. Two note per string idea. Likewise, the same thing here. Two notes per string. So you can, and this is where whole tone fingerings kind of weave around the guitar. If you want to stay in the same position, you'll go between twos and threes. So then it's zigzagging like that chess piece that can, can not go in uh, straight lines, a bishop, I think. So if I want to stay in approximately the same area, I go diagonally that way, back, diagonally, backwards and forwards. Because if I play three notes per string, I'm going to find myself going up the neck. And if I play two, I'm going to find myself going back the neck. So if I go two, three, two, three, two, and three, and kind of mix them up, it keeps me in an approximate straight line, but by going backwards and forwards. So that's licks numbers four, five, and six. Next week, we'll do numbers uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I hope you enjoy that. There we have it. Week number 21 is in the can. I hope uh, you enjoyed this week. I hope that you found something of some use. Uh, as always, please keep the comments coming. Thank you so much for all the kind support. I received some really lovely emails and some you know, great messages and so on. Uh, feel free to leave any questions either in the comments or, or direct message me. It's totally up to you. You can reach me at john, uh, john at johnwheatcroftguitar.com as well. If you want to email me, that's fine as well. You know, all the usual places are pretty easy to get hold of. So, um, yeah, I hope you have a great week. Let's hope that these new restrictions that are supposed to be coming in on Monday are not too brutal and we can uh, continue to start to repair and, and find our way back to making some uh, live performances uh, happen. I know there are some, but they're, they're few and far between, certainly for me anyway. Uh, let's hope that we can stay motivated with practice. Send me any thoughts or comments or even just suggestions or just give me a thumbs up if you like. Uh, shares are really, really appreciated. Uh, anything that we can do to spread the word for this is brilliant because you know my intention is to keep this going, uh, ongoing, uh, and obviously the more the merrier. Uh, I've been in talks with some guitar playing friends and, and uh, esteemed colleagues who are uh, up for the idea of contributing some, some guest sections, so that's something that will be coming up over the coming weeks. I hope you have a lovely rest of Sunday and a great week. I'll see you... Uh, Similar time next week, yeah, with another tune and with some great questions, hopefully a few more Django licks and lots more besides. Take care of yourself, uh, yeah, stay safe, and I will see you soon.